The housing issue across the city was very severe. In 1932, we really focus in on slum clearance. And that's where our friend Herbert Sims comes into the story. These buildings have become ingrained in our DNA as citizens walking around. To me, these communities are the, they're the heart of the city. The housing has stood the test of time. And that's one of the reasons why Herbert Sims is so compelling, because he seems so hardworking, and then this tragic end, which is really, really violent. This is Herbert Sims. If you live in Dublin, there's a chance you pass one of his buildings on your daily commute. Sims was the son of a London train driver who studied architecture at Liverpool University. He came to Ireland in the 1920s on a temporary contract and was eventually appointed the newly created post of housing architect at Dublin Corporation in 1932. Tenements were still widespread in the city he was tasked with housing. According to the census in 1901, this house came to be occupied by 17 families and that amounts to over 100 people living in this house. In the whole of the street, according to the census records, there was 897 people living on the street. In the 20s, we have Common and Gael. Politically speaking, it's much more of a middle class, maybe, approach to the problem. Fianna Foyle comes in in 1932 on the national stage, and that's when you get this real push for slum clearance. So Sims spearheads this very important development of housing and a concerted effort to tackle the slums. I was born in the tenement house and we lived up on the third floor. We only had one room in the tenements. And the one room in the bedroom was bedroom, living room, dining room, every other room you can think of. I came here in February the 25th, 1960. Blush and bright. Daughter. <laughs> Even though the bath was in the kitchen, there was a bath. And they had a toilet, which they never had, and I didn't have to listen to my mother. So all in all, it was a good change. <laughs> Between 1923 and 1931, new dwellings were being erected at an average rate of 555 per annum. The housing crisis was still severe and tenements littered the city. In 1935 alone, 1,552 dwellings were completed. And during the 16 years he was in office, Sims was responsible for the design and erection of some 17,000 new homes. One scheme that is generally fairly lauded, and it was published in a British journal in the 1940s, is the Marrowbone Lane scheme, which is behind Guinness's. Poplar Row in Ballybock, Oliver Bond, Mary Aikenhead House, Markovitz House, which is protected at Townsend Street, and Pierce House, or, or Hanover, which again is a protected scheme. So these are the buildings that form our backdrop as Dubliners, in a way a different type of backdrop to the Georgian squares and Georgian terraces, but they have become ingrained in our DNA as citizens walking around, to the extent that we don't notice them. They're such everyday experiences, they're such backcloths to our, to our streetscapes. We're in Pierce House Flats and my grandmother was one of the first residents in the 1930s. And Pierce House is actually the largest municipal housing structure in the state. For its footprint, it has more people living here than anywhere else. And when people were moved into the flats from tenement houses, they were actually moved into the flats in the same order. And it was a great way of maintaining communities. When I started taking photographs, I mean, my mother always talked about the community here being special. And I did think that that was all rose tinted glasses. But when I held an exhibition here, people flocked back from all over the world, actually. And to me, these communities are the, they're the heart of the city. If you look at the 1946 census, there's still quite a lot of people in Dublin that are sharing toilets with other families. But if you look at the areas where the new housing developments were, 
you can see that they were actually living in better housing than a lot of private uh, homeowners. I see an awful lot of correspondence around Sims is providing people with the best possible home they could have, even if it's very pedantic and he's saying, you know, we've no Bakelite, we've no timber, but I refuse to sign off on this house until there are excursion boards and until there are at least two plug points. So he seems to be really, really conscientious and possibly to his detriment. In Mary Aikenwood House, his detail and consideration for the inhabitants extended to air raid precaution bomb shelters and balconies that could accommodate beds, which could have catered for the TB crisis at the time. Chancery House dates from the end of the 1930s and it would seem that the scheme is made when Sims and his team have gained a bit of confidence and they're certainly more playful with materials than you get in the earlier schemes. Uh, what we have here is a two range scheme and the shorter side is fronted by this public park so this is a beautiful moment of giving back to the city and even when we look at this particular block while we see it's four storeys and flat roof with this overhanging Gives cornice we see that the four storeys are mediated by a three-storey brick block so it's it's really it's, it's really kind to a city that likes low-rise architecture and it introduces people living on top of each other in a city that had been absolutely ridden with tenements, which had become kind of stigmatised in a fairly successful manner. Sims also worked on expanding suburbs in Cabra, Ballyfermis and Crumlin. By the early 1950s, 6,000 dwellings were built in Crumlin alone, housing a population at the time greater than Galway City. The 20s and the 30s were hungry times in Ireland and yet there was a political will to tackle it. It wasn't being pushed to private builders and private developers to solve, that the state was actively engaged in seeking solutions to that problem rather than, you know, sort of say, well, we can't afford it. We couldn't afford it, but we did it anyway. While we can turn around as architects and architectural historians and be superior and talk about, oh, you know, this ambivalence of public space and private space and, and that design leads to ghettoisation and, and socio-economic problems contribute to that further, etc. The reality is, is that Herbert Sims and his team, whatever the dynamic was, it remains tantalisingly unknown that um, they are heroes. By the 28th of September 1948, an exhausted Sims threw himself in front of a train in Dunleary. He died later that day from his injuries. A note found in his pocket read, I cannot stand it any longer. My brain is too tired to work anymore. It has not had a rest for nearly 20 years. I think I'm going slowly mad. I haven't designed the first floor fireplace yet. You see, I've already gone barmy in the top story myself. Standing in contrast to the house and flats he helped design, his grave in Dean's Graham Cemetery lies neglected. <laughs>